let's start recording and recording in progress and welcome barbara hey all right cool well um i'll just kind of get us started so we've been doing this study called becoming peacemakers for the last three weeks this is the fourth week we've talked about colonialism capitalism and uh, and imperialism and so we're trying to understand what it means to become peacemakers in a really serious and rigorous way um for most of the folks on this call we have we have christian commitments and uh and and so pretty basic to us is a sense that we are supposed to be peacemakers um but what can sometimes happen is that Christians are really good at articulating that sentiment um, without having really good politics or analysis or a way of understanding exactly how to go about peacemaking beyond just this kind of disposition or desire, you know, to be that kind of person. So we've been taking on the study to try to understand some of the, the foundational violences that ground our world, that structure our realities, right? So beginning with colonialism, um, moving through capitalism and imperialism and seeing all these things intertwined. And so, um, and so we're getting somewhere with that, but it would be really helpful to have uh, a specific ground on which to unpack some of these concepts and to understand what peacemaking might look like in a, in a specific context. And um, of course, heavy, heavy on all our hearts. I mean, even to, to just, there's no language, right, to articulate um, what we've been observing and what we've been experiencing ourselves and seeing other people experience in Gaza. And um, and so we thought that this this particular moment and this issue is something that would be really useful to spend some time thinking about. And we wanted to bring in some folks who have more proximity to the issues, um, who have connections, who have been in organizing work around this stuff for a while. And so we're super, super incredibly privileged tonight to have Esther Farmer from Jewish Voice for Peace and Raphael Issa from, uh, from Palestinian Youth Movement. And, uh, and both of them are, are going to say just a few things. And, you know, you can kind of get a sense from the crew. This isn't like a, you know, this isn't like a lecture, like a classroom. This is just us like talking. Um, this is our church family. And we're welcoming you all to be our family, you know, for, for tonight or as long as you'd like to be be a part of our community. And so we just love for, for you all to share some stuff, whatever angle you're interested in. Um, uh, Raphael and I kind of talked about... Um, like maybe Christian Zionism being being one way of of approaching this topic, um, and and Esther, you know, just sort of free reign, you know, whatever you're you're interested in talking about. Um, so maybe Esther, I don't want to put you on the spot, but if if you feel comfortable beginning and uh, yeah, just just talking, starting from whatever point you're interested in, and and then yeah. Raphael can go, and then we can have like a larger conversation and discussion on the basis of that. So if if you wouldn't Thanks. mind, Esther. Not at all. Um, I think that sometimes the best way to learn history is with stories. So um, in sharing my story, I've learned that my story wasn't my own. <laughs> um, not only did I discover that many people had a similar story, but it's even bigger than that because many people who share my history have never felt comfortable in sharing it because their histories have been so invisibilized by the dominant narrative. Um, mm -hmm. History itself is a story, and what that story looks like so depends on who tells it. Mm -hmm. So thank you for the opportunity to tell my story as part of history. My father was born in Palestine, Hebron, Palestine, and he identified as a Palestinian Jew. Now, many people in this country think that's an impossibility. They think that Palestinian Jews didn't exist. Not only that, but the narrative for the last 75 years has been that Palestine itself doesn't exist. Israel has tried to say that Palestinians are a made up people, but Palestine was a country. And when my family lived there in the early 20th century, it was a very diverse country, approximately 80% Muslim, 10% Christian and 10% Jewish. 
and that's 100 percent. But there were other people that were living in Palestine as well that were neither Christian, Jewish or Muslim. People, for the most part, in Palestine got along very well. As a matter of fact, my grandmother, who was a very orthodox Jew, always said that Jews and Muslims got along fine in Palestine. She said we were friends, neighbors, we celebrated each other's holidays until the British got involved. And what she was referring to was the Balfour Declaration, which was around 1917, 1920, when... Um, the so-called British mandate declared that Palestine was going to be a Jewish state. So the Brits didn't do this because they loved Jews. In fact, the British were quite anti-Semitic and they wanted to get rid of their Jews. They figured, oh, we have this Jewish problem, so let's cooperate with these Zionists and solve our problem by sending them all to Palestine. And then they made a nice story. They said that Palestine was the land without a people for a people without a land. And by the way, it's interesting that you mentioned Christian Zionism because it was not a Jew who said this. It was a Christian Zionist. Of course, the problem with the story is it wasn't true. There were people there. Um, hence the title of a book that recently came out that I was co-editor of called A Land with a People. So at this point in history, most Jews were not Zionist. They weren't interested in going to Palestine. They mostly wanted to escape from European anti-Semitism. And let me repeat that, European anti-Semitism by coming to the United States. But the U.S. didn't want them. So my grandfather was a Turkish Jew who was a progressive and a peacemaker for that time, and he didn't believe in war. And when the Turks decided to conscript Jews into the army, he went to Palestine as a draft dodger. He was disappointed to learn when he got there that Turkey controlled Palestine at that point, and so he was drafted anyway. And that's how the family came to New York. I recently found out in telling my story and other people sharing their story that it was a good thing that he left when he did because draft evaders were hung. So my family lived on the Lower East Side. They were very poor, they were very religious, and they were very anti-Zionist. So the existence of my family kind of exposes the lie that Judaism and Zionism is the same. And honestly, it's kind of ridiculous on the face of it because Judaism is 5,000 years old and Israel is 75 years old. And it was created by a interna an international body of people who did not live there. And when Israel was created in 1948, 750,000 Palestinians were expelled. So my family left way before this. But I often think of my grandmother getting along fine with her neighbors in Palestine. And then in 1920, Britain declared that Jews would have supremacy over 80% of the population. I mean, what could go wrong with this picture? So again, at that time in, 19, in the 1920s, most Jews were not Zionist. And our book, A Land with a People, reclaims that history of Jewish anti-Zionism. What was their objection to Zionism? I think about it now and I realize just how smart my parents were. Um, so much of what they said has come to pass. So my father said that the Palestinians were made to pay for the Holocaust when they had nothing to do with it. He said, how can Jews be safe when they're kicking people out of their houses? He said, Jews don't need the state of Israel. The United States needs the state of Israel to protect their interest in the Middle East. The Zionists made, and this is his, his words, the Zionist establishment made a deal with the devil, and the devil was imperialism. There will be perpetual war as long as Palestinians are oppressed. And I remember my father telling us the story of how there was a boatload of Jewish refugees escaping Germany who were refused entry to the United States and were sent back to die in the concentration camps. And the Zionists said it was okay as long as the U.S. supported the state of Israel. So my father said at the time that the Zionists love Israel and hate Jews, which is the name of the story in my book, actually. 
So I was raised to be proud of the Jewish tradition of fighting for justice for everyone. And as my mother said, what it means to be Jewish is to be for justice, not just us. <laughs> Jewish tradition teaches that Jews have the responsibility to repair the world, which is called Tikkun Olam, to leave the world in better shape than they found it. Zionism says the opposite. Zionism is small, it's tribal. It asks us to reject the Jewish tradition and instead embrace a philosophy that says only Jews matter, even as that philosophy destroys what it means to be Jewish. So not only is anti-Zionism not anti-Semitic, Zionism, for me, is profoundly anti-Semitic. One of the most painful things has been the influence of Zionism on the Jewish community. The way that this absolute horror of death and destruction in Gaza and the West Bank is excused as necessary for Jewish safety. It's a lie. We have been besieged by 75 years of relentless propaganda, and here we are. Israel has not made Jews safer. We must always remember that anti-Semitism has not come from Palestine. It's come from Western European white supremacy. That is where anti-Semitism comes from and still does to this day. Jews who were devastated by the Holocaust were used by the major imperialist powers to ensure their power in the Middle East. Zionism, for me, is a corruption. It's like Trumpism. Who's the biggest bully on the block? And that, after all, is the essence of colonialism. And we don't have to know every detail of history to know what's in front of our eyes. The good news here is that there's now a real reckoning with what Zionism is, particularly among young Jews, but not only young Jews. It's all over. Our Jewish elders group in Jewish Voice for Peace is gigantic and it's growing. And we're, inund we're inundated with new members of all ages. We are particularly proud of our relationship with our Palestinian partners, including the amazing Palestinian youth movement, which has provided so much leadership in New York and around the country. We follow this leadership. And the one silver lining in this horror of genocide and destruction is that the world has woken up to what's happening. And all the amazing activity that's taking place right now is the one source of hope for peacemaking and for healing. So that's what I have to say about this. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Esther. Deeply, deeply appreciate that. Um, yeah, let's let's hold off on on questions. I'm sure things are bubbling up for folks. Um, but I'd love to hear from Raphael and then um, and then we'll open up for general discussion. So thank you so much, Esther and Raphael. Thank you for being here and take it away. Uh, Thank you so much, Esther. That was thank you for that rich history and that that, that storytelling. It is storytelling is crucial. Um, I unfortunately don't have a story to tell. I wish I did. Uh, <laughs> so I hope I can um, uh, fill your or follow in your footsteps. But I so I had actually I had spoken with Connor. I have a presentation, and so I, I guess I just want to check in with folks. I'm gonna try and speed through it as best as I can. Um, but is there anyone for whom a presentation doesn't feel like it would be fitting or appropriate in this moment? And in that case, I can just I can just try and talk. Because I know some people have different We're, preferences. People are saying presentation in the room. They're saying <laughs> yeah. both that and if there's any chance you could be a little louder, I guess. That I might be oh, just on our side of it. Yeah. But. Here. One second. Actually, let me check my. Oh, here it is. Here's the issue. Is that better? Yes. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, do the presentation. We're stoked for it. Okay. Um, well, just to introduce myself, my name is Raphael. Um, I'm with the Palestinian Youth Movement. We're a transnational grassroots movement of uh, young Palestinians and Arabs in exile as a result of the ongoing colonization of historic Palestine by the Zionist movement. Um, my name is Raphael. I am, um, I'm actually not Palestinian, I'm Egyptian, so I just wanna name that. But um, 
I've been involved in Palestine organizing for a long time and um, something I'm, I feel strongly about. And I'm glad to be in community with other um, believers because I think that this is a topic that is um, unaddressed um, in our congregations. So um, I want to start with my presentation. And again, I'm going to try and speed through it. And uh, Connor, interrupt me whenever it's like too much and I'll just, it's okay. I totally get it. Um, so I want to start with this really quick clip from Hanan Ashrawi. She's a Palestinian Christian politician. Uh, this is from an interview a few years ago. Uh, I think it was on the eve of the Abraham Accords, which is the so-called peace deal that Trump and company um, initiated. Responsible position. Very quick final thought, just a sentence or two, if you would. I think at the end of Donald Trump, he said Mike Pence would be heading to the region. If various yeah. delegates are sent to try to move peace and move, move it forward, are those conversations you will have now? Look, Mike Pence has been talking about God's will. He's not talking politics. He's talking biblical dogma and exegesis. My God did not tell me what his God tells him. I belong to the oldest Christian tradition in the world. And I don't believe that God ordained that the world has to be unjust to the Palestinians. We are the original Christians. We are the owners of the land. We are the people who've been here for centuries. How dare they come here and give me biblical uh, treatises and, and absolutist positions. If he wants to talk politics, legality, humanity, morality, fine, he will find people. If he wants to come and tell me it's been ordained, this is what the Bible told me, then I think he should go preach in a, in a church rather than talk politics. Okay, so that was just a, a little uh, something to start with. Um, and then I'm going to just quickly jump into the presentation. And I haven't used this in a long time. Here we go. There we go. Is that me? No. Oh, <laughs> sorry. Okay, so uh, Christian Zionism. Uh, so I want to, one sec. Sorry. I am not sure who it is, but some, would everyone mind muting themselves? I think someone's phone is going off. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so uh, Christian Zionism, I just want to start with sort of um, an introduction because I think it's important to sort of contextualize the conversation. Um, and again, I'm going to speed through this. Uh, Christian Zionism, it's uh, Christian support for the establishment and maintenance of a Jewish state in historic Palestine. Um, uh, Christian Zionists uh, typically refuse to hold Israel accountable for any perceived human rights violations because they think that Israel's impunity is necessary for uh, the second coming of Christ. Um, so this is, you know, directly relevant to, uh, to you all as uh, church members and as believers um, and um, something to think about. Um Importantly, most Christian Zionists do not know that they are Zionists. It's a it's a very it's a sort of a normative. Um, it's a the 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 basis for their beliefs is so normative that they don't understand that they are Zionists, especially in this country. Um, and so it began with this man named John Nelson Darby. Uh, he lived in the 1700s, 1800s. Um, and one second, I'm actually trying to find my notes. I had notes. Here they are. Here they are. Great. Okay. Um, so uh, to contextualize his sort of beginnings, uh, he, he lived at a time that was, uh, or at, at least in part, he lived during a time that was known as the Second Great Awakening, uh, which was sort of uh, a period of mass religious activity. It's sort of a resurgence of religious activity among Protestant settlers in the U.S., a lot of charismatic, emotional sort of like services and um, um, appeals to their congregations. And uh, importantly, they were really convinced that Jesus was going to return soon and that doomsday was imminent. Um, 
And so I'm actually not going to, well, I'm going to actually this part. Um, so the underlying theology um, that sort of forms the backbone of Christian Zionism is um, an interpretive system that is known as dispensationalism. Um, so dispensationalism, to sort of like summarize it, it's the idea that God works in dispensations or units of time and has done so throughout history, and that's how he interacts with humanity. Um, and importantly, it is that God's plan differs for different groups and peoples. Um, as a theological, as an interpretive system, it's relatively new to Christendom. Uh, it was totally unheard of uh, for the vast majority of the church's history, um, and is similarly unheard of in most of the uh, most Christian communities outside of the English speaking world. Um, and so typically I would run through all of the sort of the, the quick, easy steps uh, of Christian Zionism, but I, we don't have time, but I, I can run through it later if there is any questions about it. Um, but some some sort of, you guys might be familiar with some of the ideas you know, uh, uh, there's going to be a final battle. Uh, uh, there's going to be Armageddon. Uh, Israel and its neighbors are going to wage a <clears throat> war and it's going to be apocalyptic. And we all, we've all, I don't know. Is anyone familiar with um, the Left Behind series? I'm sure someone is. Yeah, Connor, Connor knows it. Uh, the Left Behind series, it's sort of the, it's sort of like the cultural linchpin of Christian Zionism in this country. It's a book series. It's very, it's crazy. It's a crazy book series. Um, and then um, just for an idea of what peacemaking is not, I want to show some clips from a, um, a conference. Um, um, so we're here with the... That was... It was the Christians United for Israel summit, I think, a few years ago, or in like two in the early two thousands, mid two thousands. Um, oops, one second. Sorry. Um, so we're here with uh, Representative Clear. They're not going to be in heaven, so okay. the other place is not too pleasant. And you're Jewish as well. Yeah. That's right. Live in Paul. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and do you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, I'm Jewish. So are you going to pray for me afterwards? We yeah, actually, we've been praying for the whole Jewish race for a long time. Really? Yes. You've been praying for the whole Jewish race? We're praying that y'all see the Messiah, because we believe that uh, Jesus is the Messiah, and you guys haven't really uh, come to that, that recognition yet, but we believe that you believe. That's the battle of Armageddon. It's 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 the believers uh, against the non-believers. It's Christians uh, against the uh, anti-Christians. Are you are you looking forward to Armageddon? I'm definitely am. So you're looking forward to Armageddon. I'm looking forward to Armageddon and looking forward to the the cleansing of the earth. Are you guys looking forward to the? Uh, so I'm gonna stop there. But that's just sort of an idea of. I mean, I, I don't know if anyone is is familiar with this sort of rhetoric, but this is sort of this is the stuff that uh, Christian Zionism espouses, um, and uh, as as you heard. Uh, Christian Zionism as a theology is hyper militant. It is destructive. It is uncompromising. Um, it justifies the vilification of uh, the Palestinian people with God's plan. I missed a word there. And it is deeply racist. Um, Palestinians are basically positioned as the Antichrist. And that can only produce uh, violence and bloodshed and so much harm and devastation. Um, it is a, a very, very, typically a very, very hard line theology, Christian Zionism. Uh, peace in the Christian Zionist mind holds negative connotations, uh, regardless of context, full stop, because peace is a concession and any concessions against God you know, our anti-God. Um, and so 24% um, of evangelicals around the world support the existence, security, and prosperity of the state of Israel, no matter what it does. Um, 
So for that reason, hearing uh, Christian Zionists say, uh, "I criti- it's okay to criticize Israel, I do it all the time, it's, it, it's, it's unlikely that it's ever going to come out of their mouths mm-hmm. because it's so um, foreign. It is, it's, not, it's, not, it's not a familiar position for them to take. Um, their strongest coalition in Israel is with religious Zionism's Jewish supporters. Um, uh, they uh, support Israeli sovereignty over the Mount, uh, over the Temple Mount, which is also where Aqsa Mosque is. They're pushing for a rebuilding of the Third Temple uh, because they think it's necessary for Jesus to return, um, and they support uh, the colonization of Palestine um, and uh, refuse to support any of its victims. Um, and then um, this is an important point. More white evangelicals than Jews in the U.S. believe that Israel was promised to the Jewish people. Um, this is, I mean, this is crucial to understand uh, that this is, um, and also, yes, it is also, sorry, Kimberly, I just saw your question. It is affiliated. The Left Behind series is affiliated with Kirk Cameron. Um, um but the, but that this por- point is important because um the idea that um that zionism is this is this purely i mean it's this um it's it's this it's a it's a it's a question of 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 jewish belief it's this it's primarily a jewish um endeavor is is a lie um, especially in the Uni- United States. Um, and then over here, we've got some of the big name players in the world of Christian Zionism. We've got Ted Cruz. We've got the Christian Broadcasting Network, which is run by, what's his face, Pat Robertson. We've got actually Dallas Theological Seminary, which is which outputs a lot of the sort of the, the theology um, that... Um, um, propels Christian Zionism in our society. Um, And APAC itself, which is the American-Israeli Public Public Affairs Committee, has said that the Christian community plays an increasingly vital role in APAC's work to strengthen ties between the U.S. and Israel. Um, And that polls indicate that support for Israel is highly related to frequency of church attendance. So again, like I said before, Christian Zionism lacks camps, but things are changing. And what I mean by this is typically it's very hard line, but but these days, especially among Christian youth, uh, young people are starting to, I mean, there there are some inroads that have been made and uh, Christian youth have been sort of questioning um, the indoctrination that their parents, that their churches have experienced over the decades. Um, but they're also trying to, um, compromise it. They're, they're, they're trying to find compromise between their beliefs. And so we're starting to see the creation of what is known as a liberal Christian Zionism, which starts to, this is what's very scary is it starts to co-opt the language of peacemaking. Um, and this is not true pe- peacemaking. It is, um, it is, it is, uh, it is not real con- reconciliation. It is not real love. It is not real truth. It is all, it, it's, it's manipulative in, in a lot of ways. Um, and in some ways it, um, it actually, it's, it's a little bit more dangerous. And so I can talk about that more. Um, and also, I want to see a time, get a time check real quick. How am I, Connor? Well, yeah, we're at 8.34. So, yeah, I think I think just a couple more minutes, and then, and then okay. we'll go back to sure. the question. Sure, sure, sure. So, um, the, the last thing is, I just wanted to sort of also share some information, because, again, you guys, this is a church group, and I think that um, I'd like to anchor the conversation with the uh, community. Then this is not to say that non, 
uh, Christian Palestinians are any less important, but I think it's important that people know who Palestinian Christians are um, and, uh, and their history. Um, Palestinian Christians are actually the descendants of the first Jewish and Gentile followers of Jesus. Uh, in the West Bank and Gaza and in East Jerusalem, they number about 50,000 um, and maybe 150,000 in uh, the rest of Palestine, which is today Israel. Um, and um, the and speaking of Esther's story, uh, the Ottoman Empire uh, engaged in sort of different waves of uh, persecution of different Christian communities, Greek, Armenian, uh, uh, Greek Orthodox, uh, Arabs, including Palestinians. And so many Palestinian Christians actually immigrated to Latin America. Some well-known Palestinian Christians are uh, Hanan Ashrawi, who was a former uh, member of the um, Palestinian Authority, a former representative, Alex Oda. He was uh, the founder of, I, I forgot the organization, but he was actually assassinated in a bombing, um, I think in the 80s. Um, Yakub Shaheen, he was the winner of uh, uh, Arab Idol a few years back. And then we've got um, uh, Stephen Salida, a brilliant uh, academic um, and lecturer who was fired from his position uh, some years back because of his criticism of Israel. George Habash, who was the founder of the Palestinian Front for the Liberation of Palestine. And then Shadia Mansour, who's actually uh, uh, Palestine's main, she's she's Palestine's female rapper. That's what they call her. Um, so, um, where are these from? Sorry. I heard someone. Yeah, I think that was Maddie. Maddie, did you have a question? Uh, if you have no, a question, no, no. No, not right now. No. Okay. okay. Cool. Uh, and then I'll, sorry, sorry. And then I'll end with this sort of clip. Um, this is just a sort of a look into how Palestinian Christians feel about Christian Zionism. Um, I think it's important that um, people better understand their position and the effects of uh, Zionism on their community. Oh my God. There are about 300,000 uh, are, Christ are Christians indeed. Leila Sansour, today uh, Christians make up about 2% of the Palestinian population in the occupied territories. What, what do you put that down to? Um, I think uh, obviously the immigration of Christians happened in droves at different times. I mean, the first uh, big uh, wave of immigration happened uh, during the First World War, uh, during the Ottoman Empire, when the Ottomans started drafting people into the army. But the major, then other waves of immigration happened in 1948 and 1967, then during the invasion of all Palestinian towns in 2002. Uh, basically, um, in Palestine, particularly, as opposed to maybe other Arab countries where they're facing other sectarian problems or inter, inter um, sort of societal problems, in Palestine, literally, the Christians are leaving because of the same reasons that Muslims are leaving, which is the Israeli occupation. Um, and the reason is simple. The economy is not stable. The future is not uh, looking hopeful. And uh, Christians have always inhabited the urban spaces of Palestine, inhabited cities like Bethlehem, Jerusalem, Ramallah, places that um, were very well positioned to benefit from the tourism industry, from pilgrimage. And because of that, the Christians had both links to the outside world as well as a, a lot of wealth. And that means um, that when the situation is unstable, when the future is bleak, the Christians have the means often to leave first. So in a city like Bethlehem, I would say both Christians and Muslims are leaving, but Christians are leaving in greater numbers. And um, it really will continue be unless... Um, and then um, I actually want to... I, I was going to share a little bit of information about Palestinian Christian resistance, and I can go through that maybe after during our discussion, but I actually want to end with my favorite verse, um, which is 
what I think is a direct refutation of uh, Christian Zionism, which is Galatians 3, 28, 29. There's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither slave nor free. There's neither male nor female, for you, you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Um, so that's it. I'll stop talking now. Uh, thank you for listening. Thank you so much for sharing. That was wonderful. <laughs> that's uh, that's it's so crazy to see that. Um, I grew up a Christian Zionist. That's part of my story. Um, fundamentalist Pentecostal context. My parents would bring home IDF T-shirts for me to wear as a kid, and uh, and I never wore them. Interestingly, they always stayed in the package. Thank God. But yeah, but that was just that was the atmosphere. Um, like what you were describing, that dispensationalist theology, the end times. All that is exactly spot on what I grew up with, and so I'm very familiar with uh, with its contours and the power that it holds politically. Um, so thank you for that. But I also think there's other folks in here who haven't been exposed to that or understand that that's not just like some fringe weird people. Like that's that's a pretty dominant political block that has a lot of a lot of power um, in the U.S. Um, so thank you so much for that. Um, I want to I want to go back to to Esther real quick, and I'm just gonna like push the conversation in a way I want to see it for a moment, and then other folks can can join in. But my my question for for Esther, I wonder if um, it seems like like this concept of colonialism is one that we've engaged in the study and is coming up in discourse about Palestine and Israel and some folks right call Israel a, a colonialist project and other folks you know attempt to refute that um I'm wondering if you could say something about the the origins of this you've you've said some but I would love to hear some more um in terms of like the language that um the you know the original Zionists were using the proximity to uh, colonialism and uh, and what you think about that discussion who you think uh you know is right or or what we ought to know about it and you're muted just so you know yeah firstly let me say i really appreciate that presentation that Raphael did i i i'm very very scared about christian Zionism. It, it really kind of scares the hell out of me. And it's the um it's that they they are the MAGA section, the the evangel the you know evangelical um fascist pretty much. And they love Israel. And you know, some of those very people who were screaming Jews will not replace us are Christian Zionist. So it's I find it very scary and I, I appreciate that that history. Um, yeah, I mean, as my father said, you know, all of the colonial powers kind of, you know, uh, came together to support this creation of Israel. And who did that benefit? Of course, the original Zionists, there were many strains of Zionism. There was labor Zionism. There was socialist Zionism. There were strains of Zionism who at one time, you know, said we should live in peace with Palestinians. But living in peace with Palestinians um, cannot include Jewish supremacy. And that is what Zionism has come to. It is Jewish supremacy is not some crazy idea. That is the reality on the ground. There is an apartheid wall. Palestinians cannot drive on the same roads. They can't go from place to place. They can't go to the ocean. They can see it from their houses. They can't go to the ocean. I mean, it is Jewish supremacy over the land. And right now, um, what we're watching is, you know, settler colonialism. I don't know if, if any of you have seen this commercial which I recently saw on, uh, have you seen it where the, um, they have this beautiful picture of Gaza and how wonderful Gaza is with these beautiful Palestinians who are working in the hotels and serving people. And, and, and then the last line is, this is what Gaza would look like if Hamas wasn't there. I mean, it's so outrageous because what it's saying is, we need to 
we need a, you know, gentrif this is gentrification on steroids. This is what settler colonialism really, really looks like. You're going to get rid of the Palestinians so that you can have Jewish settlers. And that's what they've done in the West Bank. So the original Zionists, uh, Jacobin and, and Herschel, they made no secret that they wanted the land to be to have Jewish supremacy, that Jews would be supreme in that land. And recently, of course, that was codified, codified in law with the nation state law that said that Jews had supremacy. It pretty much says that. So that's what Zionism has turned into. And if you're going to predicate somebody's safety on the backs of somebody else who actually had nothing to do with hurting you to begin with, how can you have peace? So for us in JVP, somebody asked about the organization. Jewish Voice for Peace is the largest anti-Zionist Jewish organization in the world. One of the largest anti-Zionist organizations, of course, not as big as many, many, so many Palestinian organizations. Um, but um, And at this point, we're the fastest growing Jewish organization in the world. <laughs> so I am really so gratified by that. Um, it took Jewish Voice for Peace some years to go through the process that we needed to go through to come out as anti-Zionists. We weren't always anti-Zionists. Um, and we had to go through our own process about that. This is not one of those issues that you can dialogue away. There has to be a commitment and an, and an accounting um, as to what has happened there, um, and particularly the colonizing of Palestine. I think you you cannot you can't say let's just get together and talk about this and create peace. You 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 have to support um, a certain level of reckoning, just like we had to reckon with what was done to Native people, what was done to Black people. There has to be a reckoning, and I think that that is now starting to happen in this conversation. I don't believe that the conversation will ever go back to the way it was. Um, I mean, 15 years ago, you couldn't get 15 anti-Zionist Jews in a room. And now you have thousands upon thousands, not to mention the rest of the world. So things have, the narrative has really radically changed. And that's the positive thing. But from my perspective, Zionism has always had the elements where one people were going to be supreme over another. And that will never create peace. Thank you. Thank you so much for that answer. Appreciate that. We've got a couple of hands raised. I think it was Kimberly first and then Rich and Diane. Okay, so uh, Connor, you do realize that um, at least to some of us, this this is this is new ground. Okay, um, so um, maybe I missed it while I was, you know, um, I came in like last half hour or less but this is for one hour can we get some more real good resources about all this because this is i always say that 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 the palestinian conflict and everything is so convoluted and it is and 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 you know um it's just it's so many there's so many elements i know what we're dealing with is peacemaking but you got all this other stuff that that is attached to it. I mean, you got, you know, I I happen to know the the only person that I keep in contact with from graduate school, um, and and we are like tight, is my girlfriend Lori Cohen Silverman, and I, I you know, so you know, um. I guess I, I just need, you know, a, a more more of a foundation. I really didn't really know about um even what Zionist Zionism really was in any real in-depth way. And then I also have a I kind of have a question about what um Jews learn when they go to whether it's called Hebrew school or day school that 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 early foundational training, uh, which I always kind of, without really knowing in depth about it, I always kind of said, to, man, that if we had that in, in you know, with African-Americans, that'd be, you know, we learned a foundation to 
-hmm. live off of, of, of our culture. But I'm also recently I heard that um, what is really emphasized, you know, that 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 Israel is really important, uh, you know, a, a very important element of what what Very young Jewish people girl. live. I mean, learn. Yeah. So I, 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 you know, that's all. I just need we'll, we'll give you real good because this is you got celebrities who um are um supporting um that Hollywood um include anti-semitism in 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 their uh kind of what do we call it anyway in in, in kind of the checks and balances of uh what a filmmaker has to have in their films um, yeah, yeah. for you know all that stuff so uh, racism and all that is being woven in this so i i just that's all I need. It's a real good, good foundation. Yeah, thanks, Kimberly. Thanks, Kimberly. Yeah, I had a, a question I wanted to direct to both Raphael and uh, Esther. Uh, what What do you think things are going to look like two to three years from now in the, in that area that we're focusing on? Yes. Awesome. Do you want to start, Raphael, and I'll say something after, or? No, I mean, if you if you've got a thought, if you've got an idea, <laughs> let me hear it. Well, um, you know, for me, I don't feel that I have too much to say about what it's going to look like. I don't live there. Um, it's kind of not up to me. I I do think that there is a growing movement right now that says, how about Palestinians having equal rights? Um, that would be nice. <laughs> That could be something that would be really, really useful. They don't have equal rights in that land. And so I think that that is one thing that people are talking about now. The dismantling of the apartheid wall, of the apartheid apparatus, and the end to the occupation. How that looks, I don't know. And I'm not there. But I do think that all of these other powers, especially the United States, which has always had a vested interest in keeping Israel aflo afloat. And, and, and honestly, Israel would not exist without United States money. And that's our taxes. Our taxes are paying for this murder in Gaza. And regardless of what anybody thinks about the origins of Zionism, that is what is happening now. We um, have spent billions of dollars, almost $4 billion every year um, on this, on arms to Israel to bomb Gaza and murder 27,000 people. That, that's what's happening. So what is going to be, I don't know. But there is a growing movement of Jews and Palestinians who are talking about equal rights for everybody in, in one state. And I have to say, one of the interesting things is there's all this talk about, you know, Biden talks about the two-state solution and so on. It's Israel that has been preventing the two-state solution. They actually supported Hamas. Netanyahu had given money to Hamas. He propped mm -hmm. Hamas up because he wanted Hamas to be a foil against al Fatah, which was the other Palestinian group. So, mm -hmm. you know, the two-state solution <laughs> could have happened in Oslo, and Palestinians were betrayed by, again, colonial powers. Israel did whatever it wanted to, and the United States said, fine. All of these settlements and all that stuff going on in the West Bank are illegal by international law, and yet no one has stopped them. So right now, the world has woken up, and that means that's something that's different. So it's very hard, you know, trying to live in this uncertainty is kind of a weird experience. We don't know what's gonna happen, but certainly the narrative has changed. And just to um, to say something, Kimberly, I really appreciate what you're saying. So many people don't have any um, way of understanding this issue because we have literally been besieged by propaganda. It's been 75 years of this where we have not heard the Palestinian side. Um, that is changing. But one resource is a book that I'm a co-editor of called The Land with the People. There's an amazing introduction 
that gives the whole history of this, written by my co-editor, Roz Pachetsky. And then there are stories <laughs> from Palestinians and Jews who talk about what Zionism, the impact that Zionism has had on their lives. So I do recommend it as one resource. There are many others. <laughs> Thank okay. you. Thank you. Thanks. So Raphael. I have a Maddie, Maddie before you Raphael. Oh, yeah, Raphael's next. Oh, okay. Sorry, Maddie. I was just gonna respond real quick. Um uh I also wanted to I also dropped in the chat um a link to one of my favorite documentaries called Roadmap to Apartheid. Um I think it's an excellent sort of um it provides an excellent overview of what is happening on the ground um with a little look at um uh the the change that we're seeing in the world uh richard to your question i think you know i i i've been in the streets at this point for uh on a weekly basis for for several months now and i mean i and every 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 week we see new faces um because i think in particular young people are feeling that they they are they're feeling that tension they're feeling like why is my money going towards this why have i been funding this why have our parents been funding this for generations and they're sick of it um so in that sense, I'm really, really hopeful because there is massive, massive international pressure for Israel to uh, cease its colonial project. And I don't know what's going to happen in the next three years, but what I will say is that Palestinians have this term called sumud, which means steadfastness. Um, and it, I mean, it characterizes the Palestinian struggle. It's been 75 years of fierce, fierce resistance to the colonization of their homeland. Um, so I, I can't say what's going to happen, but I know that Palestinians aren't going to stop fighting. And whatever does happen, what, peace will necessarily require uh, a couple of things, including the Palestinian right to return uh, sure. to their homeland. Um, which is possible. Uh, actually, I think up to 80% of the lands that Palestinians were expelled from are uninhabited, which is actually really important. Um, this is uh, from a Palestinian scholar. Um, the decolonization of all uh, Arab lands and uh, the granting of equal rights to Palestinian citizens of Israel. And then I think that will you know, those are the three basic demands of the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement. And I think that whatever happens after that, it'll be what it'll be what colonized people demand. You know. Thank you both. Yeah. Yeah. Go yeah, ahead. Maggie. So it seems as though, even though international forces and even Biden, in some way, has been calling for Netanyahu to pull back. And he has just ignored everything and everybody. So America funds Israel quite a lot. What would be the blowback? Let's say America decided, okay, you've gone too far, Netanyahu. Let's do something about this. And stop funding Israel. What would be the blowback to America if they had the balls to stand up and tell him he was going too far. What, how would America suffer? Um, how would America suffer? Yeah, how would America suffer if they had the nerve to stand up and stop funding Israel? Yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. No, go ahead. <laughs> go ahead, Esther. No, you go, go, go first. <laughs> well, that's a really great question. I am actually confused myself as to what interest at this point, the United States has, they don't really need the oil there, but they want a base. So again, it goes back to this imperial kind of design. But I think your question is very important because APAC, which is, was mentioned by Raphael earlier, has, they are the mafia. They mm -hmm. literally go around and tell people, if you won and you say anything against Israel, we're going to make sure that Millions of dollars go to the other candidate, 
and we're going to destroy you. So JDP, we are going to go after APAC. And, um, you know, with our partners, many partners, many Palestinian partners, we need to do that because that is the financial stranglehold that is taking place. And you mentioned earlier, Kimberly, about the McCarthyite environment around Hollywood and stuff. That exists in universities when we saw what happened to the president of Harvard, when with this constant McCarthyite, you cannot say a word about Israel or you'll lose your job. I mean, Roz Pachetsky, my, my co-editor of A Land with the People, they had her picture on a truck and it said, biggest anti-Semite in City University of New York, Roz Pachetsky. And they had a picture of this 81-year-old woman. I mean, this is this is this is what's going on, this McCarthyite environment. And and they're getting desperate, and they're getting more and more desperate because Israel has lost the public relations war. They've lost it. So um they are now a pariah nation in the world in the world, regardless of what Biden and the United States says. So I actually do not think that Biden, I think Biden can lose the election off of this because young people are not gonna come out and vote for him. People yeah. are really furious. What Raphael said earlier is really true. People are furious and they are not going to vote for him as long as he continues this and doesn't demand that our money, our tax money not be used for this genocide. So, yeah, but they may not vote for the other person either. Come on. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm, come on. listen. I mean, that's a, that's Trump a is worse. I, I understand that. I'm not. I'm not advocating for one thing or the other. I'm just saying that public opinion in this country is pro ceasefire, and Biden is not listening. Yeah, I He's, cannot say why. I don't know. Yeah, but I must say though, before before last year, I think 2023 to me got the most uh most what should i say is the first time that i have noticed that there was so much opposition for israel i mean we were fed this propaganda that the palestinians were the worst people and you know and and because of biblical prophecy a lot mm -hmm. of us christians believe that yes god gave this land to israel but I have always questioned, okay, so God gave the land to Israel. That is what we were taught. Of the whole of Israel, this is the spot that they are fighting the Palestinians for. So in 1948, after the Second World War, and they were scattered all over, and they decided to go back to Israel. Palestinians were there. Why not go to a different area? This may seem simplistic, but why not go to a different area where the Palestinians were not in charge of their own 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 destiny there. It just seems to me, it's like a child. I have a marble and because I have the marble and maybe the marble looks nice and shiny, another kid wants to take that marble from me and wants to fight me to the death. And I really appreciate that 2023, people's eyes got opened. You know, I mean, I have, I, I'm not fully, I don't fully understand the whole situation from biblical times to now. But what I'm seeing now is that Israel is committing genocide. A whole generation of babies and children that have been killed. So the next generation, to me, is going to be a weaker generation. Except that those who survive are going to grow up hating Israel and this whole thing just continues. I honestly... I mean, it makes me sad that this is going to go on for uh, maybe another century. Not in my lifetime, for sure. I'm 70. I'm on my way out the door. So I don't think that, you know, and it, it's really disheartening that we all have this great space that God gave the can't learn to share. So that's my little two cents. Thank you for that, Maddie. Appreciate that. I wonder if, if Raphael, if you'd mind responding to her initial question, and then we'll get to Chiling and Ping, and then we'll we'll close out. I'll just have a final question, and and we'll close. Sure. Yeah. I mean, um, Esther's point is 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 important. The the um, the benefits that we as Americans, we as a country, receive 
are it, it's it's totally disproportionate as in on in their favor is israel has they have a subsidized healthcare system they've got um uh, a really really strong um um uh environmental sector their their weapons manufacturers their technology manufacturers we don't really get anything it's very limited um uh and so this i i, I don't know I, you know i haven't been in the previous sessions about where you guys explored imperialism but um israel as an ally is um is also um in terms of imperialism is an ideological ally as well um it's a it is a it is a it's it's supposed to be it's supposed to sort of sequester the rest of the region um so that america has easy access to um the any of the any, any of the surrounding lands but right now any tangible benefits are very very limited they're very limited um um and yeah so uh i mean yeah it's limited but really they they get a lot we get we get nothing <laughs> Thanks, Rafael. Yeah, so Ping or Chi Ling? Yeah, let me just unmute. Um, yeah, I'll try to be quick. I mean, there's just so much, and I really appreciate kind of raising this and for our two guests for sharing with us and uh, for all the insightful comments. Uh, I have so many thoughts, but I just want to go back to what Connor started with and then you know, come back to the last few comments, which made me a little depressed, but um, you know, the, the problem is, you know, you're talking about Christian Zionists in this country um, and their support for a lot of this stuff that's going on. The problem is most of those people don't consider themselves Christian Zionists. They don't even know what the term means. They consider themselves biblical Christians. Yeah. That's the problem. Yeah. And that first clip that I think Raphael played with a articulate woman was saying, you know, look, that's how you, uh, you know, was um, talking about, you know, God's will or what Maddie was saying, you know, uh, you grow up in certain churches and you say God gave them the land. Once you have that, you can't have a dialogue like that woman said, you can't talk about politics, policy, human rights, ethics because all of that is below God, right? I mean, once someone raises God as behind their cause, I mean, the dialogue's over. And the problem is when you talk about Christian Zionism, there's a huge, huge overlap between Christian Zionism and MAGA evangelicals. Mm -hmm. So what MAGA, what Esther said is scary, scary as hell. But you say young people are not gonna vote for Biden, so they're gonna vote for someone or not vote at all. And that other person who is heavily supported by what you call Christian Zionists, and he will bribe them the same way he bribed them with Supreme Court appointments. He doesn't believe, he doesn't care about anything, but he will bribe those people for their votes and do what they want, like move the embassy, you know, all the stuff that you're telling us how terrible it is, and we agree with you. But I mean, the, the these are like existential threats, you know. Um, and I hear what Maddie's saying. You know, it's like it's been going on for decades, and some stuff goes on for centuries, and you feel like it's not going to be resolved in your lifetime. But you know, I appreciate. I think it has to start with education. What you guys are doing dialogues, people uh, that, who don't realize they are Christian Zionists and the implications of that and having these sort of dialogues to expand that. So thank you for being with us. Yeah, that's, those are those are really good points, Ping. I appreciate that. Yeah, so as, as we come to a close here, um, yeah, I'm thinking about 
I mean, you know, Kimberly's talking about it being convoluted, you know, it being a complicated thing. We need a lot more resources to to get our heads wrapped around um around this the history in Palestine. And in certain ways it it is historically complex. Um, but maybe not as morally complex as people like to to say that it is. Um something that this this interesting phenomenon on social media is that people will will retweet um, a tweet from two years ago, three, five, 10, 15 years ago, and they'll say, look at the date. It'll be some some atrocity that Israel carried out in Gaza or the West Bank. It'll be some bombing campaign. It'll be mutilated children. And people will say, look at the date to show that it, it happened way, way before October 7th, right? That this that this pattern of violence is something that's constitutive of the state project of the zionist entity and and it has so it's not as if that what is happening now it in certain ways is is new in terms of its scale um but we have been finding ways of justifying these atrocities for years and there is nothing that necessarily says that we're going to learn from this mm -hmm. Um, in a way that prevents these this kind of violence from occurring in the future. And any in, in certain ways, it's sort of desensitizing some contingents by saying, you know, by if this if this doesn't motivate you, if this doesn't make some kind of claim on you, any of the, you know, they call it mowing the lawn, right? Like going in and bombing Palestinians, killing a few, destroying some infrastructure to make sure that they're preoccupied with building themselves back up and can't restore themselves to, to full strength. So they mow the lawn period periodically, right? That's not going to be something that makes any sort of claim on the conscience of the West, of the imperialist powers that are propping it up if a genocide isn't doing anything for us. So we should be circumspect. We should be cautious in our hope. But what I want to ask of you two is what can we be doing practically in this moment? Of course, something like this is, you know, one one instance of something we can be doing to create awareness and bring peace. Um, but what are some other ways that you can imagine that we might be peacemakers um, in this specific context, but, you know, even more generally, um, do you have any ideas for us? Well, I, I mean, I'll start and then Raphael can join in. I mean, I, I think your comment tree was very interesting because um Young people are talking about sitting out this election because they're so angry. And that is why I think it's really, really important that we put the pressure on our politicians and most especially on Biden. He has got to change course and he's getting pressure. I mean, there are million, literally millions of people in the streets and the whole world. I mean, the judge in California, an American judge, said this was plausibly genocide. There's a lot of pressure, but we need to increase that pressure because the policy has to change. So I, I say to people, join us, join those things in the streets, join the activity. I think it's great for people to read. There's another wonderful film called 1948 that I would recommend. Um, that people see, which really shows there. And there's a terrific um, uh, series by Al Jazeera on the whole, and I don't remember the name, Raphael, and I saw it and I can't remember the name of it, you might know it, but it's really, really excellent about how the, the whole history of this as another resource. Um, so education is extremely important and also the constant pressure on our political system to change course, it, we have to do it. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Yeah, Raphael. Yeah, um, and then to your question, the, the film is called um, Al Nakba, which is the Arabic word for catastrophe. This is what Palestinians call 1948. Um, so this, I mean, this is really important also, you know, like when we're, when I, and I, and I understand where it comes from. I understand that, uh, I think that a product of the propaganda machine is convincing us that this is a difficult question to answer. And I think it's done so very, very effectively. Um, but the thing is, Palestinians have been saying for years and years and years, they've been talking about what they've been experiencing. 
they've been talking about the fact that they can't exceed uh, 40% of the population in Jerusalem. This is official policy. They cannot exceed 40% of the population, no more than 40% Palestinian. If any other country had any policy that instituted a limit on demographics like that, we would say it's apartheid. We would say it's racist. We would say that the moral position is clear. And I think that that's what we need to do, especially as believers. I think it's it, it calls us to be courageous in many ways that are, I think, deeply uncomfortable. Um, but I think that, um, you know, to your question, Connor, I am... Um, I'm, I'm really, um, I mean, I'm in, I mean, my, I'm in, like, I think connecting with Palestinian Christians, Palestinian Christian organizations, um, they are an excellent resource. Um, and I think um, they, um, I, I think, I, I, I don't know, I have Palestinian Christian family and my, my and my mom's best friend is a Palestinian Christian from Gaza, and uh, her aunt uh, was uh, shot and killed uh, back in December uh, and left to die on the street. And in the wake of it, I was I I was so I was moved by the by the the their the conviction that they had in uh in 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 God's love like they they are so deeply committed um and i it's incredible to learn from them and i would recommend a couple of different organizations but i really do think that they embody uh Christ's love in a lot of uh ways and um they're they're a resource they're 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 people to look to, um, people to learn from, and uh, they are the living stones of the land. Um, and I mean, so this is this is again encouragement specifically for you all, especially as church members. Um, but um, yeah. Well, yeah, that that sounds to me like like more education and connecting with good organizations that we can partner with and give us guidance for how we can be practice, practically materially supportive on the ground. Um, and that sounds like great advice. So thank you both. Thank you to Esther and Raphael. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. Thank you to your organizations for all that you're doing. Um, we really, really appreciate it. Can we give them a little, little round of applause? <laughs> So thank yeah, you thank you so us. much. Yeah, of course, it was great to have you, and uh, we really will will attempt to honor um, your work tonight, and uh, you know, and try to respond uh, well to it. So thank you so much for being with us, and thank you to everyone who participated in the discussion tonight. Appreciate all of you, and uh, yeah, we'll see you all soon. Have a good night, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.